welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Father, for such an awesome worship time that we had, Father, drawing into your presence. And we thank you, Father, for what you've started doing in this place tonight already. And we just ask, Father, for you to continue doing mighty things through the audience here, Father. And we thank you for all that you're doing tonight, for blessing us in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, praise God. This is... uh, this is really a privilege for us. And for those of you that don't know, you know, uh, you know, or you missed maybe who we were, I'm Pastor Mike Bryan, and this is my wife, Pastor Sue, my better half. Sometimes I tell people I'm actually uh, past, uh, Mr. Pastor Sue, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> but, the, uh, but anyway, you know, we w- are really believing that you're going to be receiving something tonight. And our subject tonight that we're going to be discussing is a little bit different. Um, we're going to be talking about blended families. We're going to be talking about, uh, you know, it's a little bit on the parenting end. And, and also just, uh, you know, also, you know, if you don't have kids, that's cool too. Because I believe you're going to be able to learn what it is. That some things, you know, we don't have all the answers by no means. But, but you know, it's kind of cool that we all have such different experiences. All the pastors that have, have spoken so far have such different experiences. And, and, you know, God's put us all together, Right so that uh, we're the right team to be here and to be able to, to work with our pastors, Pastors Jim and Deborah, and it's really a cool thing. But um, we wanted to tell you just briefly a little bit about ourselves and how we kind of got into the situation where we got in and, and where, why we are where we are, and uh, just to kind of fill you in a little bit. So first, I wanted to, um, I was curious, how many of you out there are um, in a blended family? You have a blended family. You know, in other words... You know, one of one or two of you, um, before you got married, you had kids. Okay, you put your hands down. How many of you um, are single mom? Just curious. Don't be embarrassed about it. How many of you are single dads? Okay, that's cool. Well, you know what? Um, I think we're going to address to address you guys. How many of you are married? Just period, married. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. How many of you aren't married? But you're believing for the right one. Okay. Hey, they're all centered back there. Okay, wait. Keep your hands up. How many of you girls aren't married? All right, guys, look. All right? Okay. All right, put your hands down. How many guys? neck night after. Yeah. Neck night. Okay, guys, if you're not married, but you want to be, raise your hand up. Oh, look at them. Okay. All right, girls, take an eye out. Okay. Anyway, just wanted to... Um, to let you know who we have in the crowd here. <laughs> you know, actually, I've met my wife in church, and so, uh, so it's a good place. Yes. I tell you, it's a lot better than meeting them at a bar. Amen. You know. But uh, I, just so that you know a little about me first, and then my wife's going to gonna share a little about herself. But I was actually, uh, I, I was kind of a mess when I was a kid, and, uh, you know, a little on the artistic side and stuff. But... I was uh, not autistic, okay, I said artistic, <laughs> but I, I was married, and I was out on my own, uh, uh, away from my house, and working full-time as an artist, and with a new baby on the way, by the time that I was 17 years old. And so a lot of you, you know, you may have teenagers that are just that, and you go, oh, no, you know, mm-hmm. some of you have been there, you know, the same way, but that, that was how it was for me. And so I learned an awful lot about life before uh, a lot of people even finished high school, you know? And, uh, you know, and so I, I started out that way, and, and uh, the marriage, of course, you know, I was a mess. Like I said, I didn't know Jesus, and, and uh, the marriage was doomed to failure from some of the things that, uh, that we did or didn't do. And so it didn't work out. And... You know, we divorced, and I got full custody of my daughter, my little girl at the time. She was three years old when we um, finally divorced. And so here I was, 21 years old, and uh, a single dad, raising a little girl myself. And so um, I was single for nine years. And to be honest, I, I kind of thought that that was probably was where I was going to be for the rest of my life, in that singlehood. And, and I, really, I had gotten to where I was happy about that because I'd fallen in love with Jesus in the meantime. And so I got saved when I was 24 years old. 
And uh, my little girl got saved too. She was in kindergarten at the time. And you know, what was nice, I think, for, for me was the fact that my little girl was an artist in heart too. We both had the same kind of temperament. And it sure makes it easy. You know, sometimes um, you get to thinking that um, being a parent is really pretty easy. How come people are having a hard time out there? And that's how it was with me because we were both on the same wavelength a lot. We, uh, we were able, we understood each other. We were able to get along very well. And she was very compliant, and at least she appeared to be to me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was really, it was a, a neat experience for me. I mean, I, you know, I didn't care, you know, that she was a little girl. I mean, I, I loved her to pieces, and, you know, I taught her how to camp and how to fish, and, and you know, she just did things with me, Probably you know. So she would, you know, she, uh, yeah, she'd always wore a baseball cap, you know. And uh, I did learn how to curl hair, you know, at the time. It just didn't look right when I did, that's all. <laughs> but, you know, she didn't care, I didn't care, you know. We just, uh, we liked to draw pictures together, you know. <laughs> so that was just... That was kind of how we were. And I used to think that parenting was just a piece of cake. I couldn't understand how come anybody was having problems with that. And in fact, I, I, uh, I used to think that I could probably teach a seminar on it without any problem at all, you know. Well, like I said, Sue and I met at church. And uh, my daughter was 12 and a half years old when we got married. And, uh, you know, and so that was 28 years ago, last uh, two weeks ago, huh? We celebrated our 28th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. She originally begged him to date me. Yeah. <laughs> because she knew her at church, too. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so when we got married, Chantel was 12 and a half, and uh, she was, you know, a sweetheart. But, you know, we had the routine of she went to her, her real mom and stepdad's uh, house every other weekend. And so we had this routine, and you know, when we first got married, um, I, I, I realized that I wasn't just marrying one person, I was marrying a family, and it wasn't about how I wanted to do things, I had to fit into how they were already doing things. And you know, there were the challenges of that, and if you ex have experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know, here I thought, uh, you know, I was gonna try to please my husband, he wanted casseroles, but then he'd never made casseroles, so his daughter didn't like casseroles because all the food was mixed together. And so I remember going, God, do I please my husband? Do I please my new daughter? What do I do here? And so there were those kinds of, of challenges. And um, I had a commute. I was commuting out of town an hour each way. And, and so uh, early in the marriage, I believed God to be able to work in town and part time. So I was home by the time she got home from school. And I believed God for more per hour, less hours. You know, that can work. And so. Um, I was home when she got home from school, and, and I had to press into getting to know her. And, and so um, uh, there, were, there were the challenges of that, you know, just getting to know her. And um, there were some things that we did right early on uh, that uh, in talking with people, you know, Mike and I have, you know, been on staff here at The Rock, as, as we've said, you know, 18 years. And in 18 years, you can learn a few things, right? Right. And so besides our personal experience, you know, I've ministered to many people in my office. Both of us have. We've done, we've ministered to a lot uh, of you also. So if this sounds familiar, I'm not talking about you. No, I'm teasing. But, um, but in, in dealing with situations, um, I realized that a lot of the things that we learned early on, we actually did right, and, and, and it helped the situation. And uh, one of the things that, that Mike did that was really good, we talked a lot before we were married, and he, we shared each other's hearts. And he met with Chantelle, he talked with her, and he said, you know, now when Sue and I get married, she's going to be part of the governing body. You know, she's going to come alongside me, and what she says is going to go also. Well, he knew this girl, he had parented her, her, you know, up until that, you know, he'd parented her for 12 and a half years, but I didn't know her. And so I was kind of like Sergeant Sue on the scene, ready to whip this girl in shape. You know, she didn't know how no. to clean the toilet, and her room was messy, and you know, bless God, I was gonna, you know, fix her. And um, so I came on a bit like gangbusters, and, and really was driving a wedge between her and I really quickly. And, um, but one thing I was so appreciated with Mike is he gave me the freedom to fail. And I know that must have been very, very hard watching his daughter kind of, you know, 
get wounded by my abrasiveness, but, uh, but yet what he would do is he would never flinch. If, if I said, you're going to bed now, you know, or whatever, went off in one of my tirades. He would, he would uh, she'd look over at him and he'd nod and he'd say, you know, you heard her, time to go to bed, you know, and he would just like, amen, what I would say. But then later in the bedroom, he'd say, I understand what you're trying to do, but we've got to go about this differently. And he would like school me off the record, you know what I'm saying? And, and it's very important in a stepchild situation that they not get the clue that you're not on the same page. And obviously, if they've been raised a certain way and now they have the you know, other spouse coming along, the step-parent, and doing things a different way, it can cause friction. And there's going to be, a, there, you're going to have a, a, you know, a, a, a growth process there. You're going to be on a learning curve. And so you have to just figure that. But what he did that was so right was, like I said, he gave me the freedom to fail, but then he educated me alongside. And, and if I felt like I said, she's just, she's just being rebellious, she's not obeying me, you know, whatever, he'd say, no, she's just a dreamer, artist, space case. And she forgot, legitimately forgot what you said. I think it's rebellion in her heart. No, trust me, she forgot. You know, but I mean, you know, he would educate me because, you know, as, as a parent, a biological parent, you know your child's motivation, you know their heart. And I didn't know that. So in a, a step-parenting situation, you're growing in your marriage, but you've also got to be committed to grow with that child. Amen? Amen. And so... Um, so at one point I was really struggling and um, I remember, you know, I was doing all the work of the mom. I was uh, doing the laundry, doing, getting dinner ready, doing, uh, trying to figure out how to cook, you know, a three course meal every night instead of just broiling my little piece of meat in a salad. And, um, and uh, I remember she got a call from her mom, you know, and here I'm doing all the work of a mom and in my opinion, her mom was, you know, pretty flaky and, you know, had my opinions. But, um, but I'm doing the work of a mom. She was with us full time and just going home to her real mom, or going to her real mom's every other weekend. And um, she was hanging up from talking to her mom on the phone. And she'd say, bye, love you, mom. And I just remember standing there at the, the sink. And inside it was like, I want that. You know, I was doing all the work of the mom, but because we didn't quite have that relationship, all the kudos were going to somebody else. Do you hear me? And, you know, as parents, you know, we go through a lot for our kids, amen, to yeah. so have those snotty nose tugs, you know, to have that, you know, that little, that little card they make or whatever. And so I remember talking to God about it, and a wise woman at church took me aside and said, you know, I, I felt inside that I was struggling trying to be the perfect mom and to try to assume that role. And she said, you know, don't, she's got a mom. Don't try to be her mom. Just be another wonderful woman of God in her life. And what does love tell you to do? And I remember a big pressure lifted off me, and I stepped back, and I said, I'm going to love this girl. I'm going to find out what makes her tick. I'm going I'm to find a common interest. And, and sure enough, you know, she loved horses. So we started taking horseback riding lessons together, and, and we did some things like that. And she, since she was eight years old, was believing God for a horse. She wanted a black horse. And she had a picture of a black horse on the refrigerator. And we were in a Word of Faith church. We were, you know, believe you receive when you pray. And so every time she went by the refrigerator, she'd say, thank you, Father, for my black horse. Thank you, Father, for my black she horse. She was in faith. You know. Well, Mike really didn't want her to have a horse. <laughs> but I saw this little girl standing in faith, and I said, you know, let's not limit God. And so I kind of got in agreement with her. He wasn't sure he was happy about that. But we took horseback riding lessons, and we prayed in agreement. And I said, you know, believe God. Let's not limit God. We're not going to, Dad said, we're not buying you a horse. But God can sure give you a horse. Well, when she was 15 and a half, my sister back in Kansas called me and said, doesn't Chantel want a black horse? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, I've got a black little foal just for her. And they, she trailered it out for us. And at 15 and a half, Chantel went to work at McDonald's. Her whole paycheck went for board for that horse. And, and she, her first horse was a Greenbrook horse, but you're not supposed to do that. But she took lessons together with that horse, broke it in, and trained it. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. We had that horse in our lives uh, for, for many, many years. And it was a real source of growth. But we turned a corner in our relationship when I began to care about what she cared about. And I began to enter her world. You know, we, there's an expression that we use in children's ministry, that you enter a child's world through the door of their interests. And I had to find out what her interest was. It wasn't all about me and her changing and adjusting to me. 
but it was me finding out what made her tick and what she cared about and what the love of was of her heart and getting to know her and making a concerted effort to spend time with her so that we could begin to connect. And when your child loves you, they love your God. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. You know, it's kind of funny, too, because thinking about when she was uh, talking there, it reminded me of even, you know, the fact that my little girl had me wrapped around her finger, you know. <laughs> and I know none of you guys understand that, right? But, uh, but she did. I mean, she went everywhere with us. She did everything with us. And uh, I remember one time when we first got married, she, uh, you know, it, this is how conditioned I was, you know, as being the, the parent who is the provider type, you know. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're in there in, in the living room, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, we had just gotten married and come up back from our honeymoon and stuff. And my, my 12-year-old, almost 13-year-old, is in, the, in her bedroom down right the hall. Right across the bathroom, from the bathroom. Right across from the bathroom, okay. And, but what it was was all of a sudden she goes, Dad. And I go, what? And she goes, I'm thirsty. Could you bring me a glass of water? And I said, oh, Okay. And I get up and I start doing it. And she puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, don't you dare. <laughs> I go, what? She goes, can't you see? She's right across the, the hallway from the bathroom. She can get her own water if she's thirsty. You know, and, and I realized at that point, something happened on the inside of me. I realized, wow, you know, we are in for a change for sure. <laughs> you know, because, you know, she, <laughs> she had been there, you know, and I had pampered her for a long, long time. Well, which kind of brings us to... This, oh, she didn't also say that, you know, I had gotten, when I got saved, I got radically saved, all right? I mean, I really did. I got radically saved and, uh, you know, went, um, went full extreme from one, one extreme to another, you know, and, uh, and even to the point to where I, I really did not want my daughter to even watch TV at all. And, you know, I knew that that was impossible to do it. I didn't read newspapers. I didn't, you know, all that, you know, because I just didn't want anything to interfere with God, you know? And uh, things have changed a lot. But, but anyway, what happened was uh, I had gotten rid of our TV set and stuff. And so I just had, just for the sake of, you know, you don't want to be totally without, I had a little black and white TV set with a little, uh, you know, uh, metal uh, aluminum foil up on the top and stuff, you know, just, to, just enough to, to stay connected. And, and uh, you know, and of course, my wife got involved in, well, yeah, just quickly, you know, we're, we're just, just first married and Chantel's trying to watch TV and she's adjusting the antenna with all the snow and trying to watch a TV. I mean, you, you know. think that this was in 1953 or something, you know. It's 1984. Yeah. But anyway, I said, honey, really, uh, we could maybe buy a colored TV. And right then she thought, oh, this, this lady's yeah, a nice she one. Bought to have to her. <laughs> she bought into she her. She was you glad know. I was around. <laughs> Nowadays, it's, it's not that. It's an iPhone or something like that. We're surprised how many kids... Actually, I, we, we went in and did praise and worship with the uh, first graders a, a few weeks back and, and found out that there was probably six or seven of them that have iPhone themselves already. You know, I mean, that's how our, our well, that's a whole other subject, right? <laughs> anyway, but anyhow, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about priorities because what we found is that we've, you know, through this process and stuff, and, and you know, this isn't anything new probably for most of you, but we found that you have to have certain priorities in your life. And you need to have things in the right priorities, just like I was saying about the incident with my daughter wanting her water and stuff. You know, we had to have, we had to readjust our priorities to be what God would have. And so the basic priorities, and you could write these down if you want, but, but this is the way I see them. And I think, number one, it needs to be God. Definitely. Right? Definitely. And number two, it needs to be your spouse. Number three, it needs to be your children or your family, your children and your family. You know, you've got your... your um, parents and stuff too, you know, if you know, your parents are still alive. And then fourth would be your job and your ministry and your friends, the people that you hang out with and stuff. And so, um, so you know, you've got those four things. And it's kind of neat because I think that, that you can see it more like a chain of command. You know, one is greater than the other, leads to the other, leads to the other, you know, in the area of importance. Yeah. Now, but, so I wanted to talk a little bit about these because... First is, you need to put God first. You need to put God first in everything. Of course, you know, that means, of course, you know, you want to get up first thing in the morning. You want to, you know, worship God. You want to keep him first in your finances. You know, you do the tithe, you know, which is the first 10% off the top, you know. You, you keep him in the middle. 
of your life, you know, and he becomes the first thing, you know, the first, your love, you know, your number one love is, is really God. Yeah. And, uh, and, but also what you need to do is you need to, you need to keep him in the middle of the following priorities. You need yeah. to keep him in the middle of your relationship with your spouse. Yeah. You know, because he is number one, you know, you need to have him in the center of your marriage. Yeah. And that was what was so neat about the way that, you know, because of us meeting in church and the fact that when we had gotten together and talked, we both realized that we were both called to the ministry. We both knew what we were in for. And we both exalted Jesus at the same time. And we were going to keep him in the middle of our marriage. You know, and, uh, and I think there's something that happens when, when you go to God, as a, especially, you know, once you've been divorced and you've, been a, a single parent or even if you aren't a single parent but you've just been divorced and you you know uh, you approach your next marriage if you get married again you approach your next marriage in a little different way you realize I am going to go before God and I'm going to find out that this is the real person this is the one that God's called to be in my life you know kind of this uh, you know like Dr. Chan was talking about this morning you know um, it turned out that 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 was what I did you know I went to God and and I met my wife at, at church and and I fell in love with her in the natural but I also knew that I needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this woman was the one that God had for me and that's what you need to do because <clears throat> because when you do that when turbulent things happen in your life in your family then you know what you can always go back to God yeah. he's the one that said for you to get married He's the one that said that she was the one. And what happens is you, you never, ever entertain what we call the D word. You know, you never, you never even have to talk about divorce or anything. What you need to do is you need to go before God and take the situation. If you have an issue that you're dealing with with your spouse, take it to God. Yeah. Say, God, you know, you are in the middle of our marriage and, you know, we're putting you first place. Yes, yeah, good. You know, your spouse comes before your children. Yes. You know, and, and the Bible says that wives are supposed to honor and respect their husband as the head of the house. Yeah. They're supposed to submit. And what that means, you know, is to, you know, submission means to support the mission, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So a woman is really supposed to be submitted to the husband. But on the other hand, you know, the husband is supposed to love the wife as Jesus does, the head, you know, as Christ does. And they're supposed to love your wife like Christ does. And so, you know, you have to, um, you've got to, in turn, she shows you respect, but you have to be able to, to honor her and keep her in the right place as well. Yes. You know, she needs to be the queen of the house. Yes. You know, yeah, I hear an amen from some women around there. You know, you need to see her as the queen of the house. Mm -hmm. You know, and she needs to see you as the head of the house as well. Now, the king, yes. And what happens is that's, that's tough is that if you have, what did you do back there? <laughs> I was bowing. No. Oh, Lord. But the thing is, if you have kids and you bring those kids in, it can be tough because you, you know, especially if you've raised them, like I had nine years of raising this little girl by myself, um, you know, my image of her was a totally different image. And, you know, um, it was difficult for me to relinquish some of that and put my wife in the place that she needed to be. My little girl did not need, she was not the queen of the house anymore, even though she was for a while, <laughs> you know? She wasn't the queen of the house forever. And um, so anyway, you know, that's, you know, your, your spouse. And then you have to also put God first in the area of your, your children and, and your family. Yes. You know, always see Jesus in the middle of your family. We had a, a commitment that we wanted our kids to be exposed to God everywhere, everywhere that they could. And that was just, that was us, you know? I mean, we were two, two people that were believing to be in ministry and stuff, and, and we just wanted our kids to um, have, you know, be around God as much as possible. We wanted them in Christian schools so that the influences would be that way. I'm not saying you have to do that. You know, maybe you can't afford that. That's okay, God, there's plenty of Christian teachers out there as well. But, uh, you know, for us, that's what we wanted to do. You know, we put them in Christian school. We, even our vacations seem to, a lot of times, be centered around, if nothing else, missions things. 
that we would go on. You know, we've, we've been around the world with our kids. And it's been a, been a great experience, you know, keeping them involved in, in church and stuff. And we also wanted to keep them involved in ministry. And so, you know, being here at the children's ministry really makes it easy because we were able to always have them, you know, helping to lead praise and worship or teaching or different things like that. And it's been, been always neat. In fact, when we first, um, before, right before we came here, we were actually traveling children's evangelists. You don't think that takes faith. Yeah, that takes faith. <laughs> To live from paycheck to paycheck, that way when there are no paychecks, no, but honorarium, uh, honorarium to honorarium, yes. But anyway, what would happen was uh, we would go out and our whole family did it. We just traveled in our van and uh, every one of our kids had a different part to play. My oldest daughter, you know, she played a part of, uh, I, I did this character called Doctor Who and she played Nurse What in that. Uh, my little girl, my middle daughter she ended up we get, got a uh, have you ever seen this pink gorilla costume running around that was actually hers and so she was a pink gorilla named priscilla and then our little boy joey was just an, an infant at the time and he was even in it he played the the smallest member you know when we would do the little skits called with the time machine and things like that you know and so you know it was just a, a lot of fun we've always kept them involved in things like that and with when, but when you think of the chain of command of things, you have to kind of always realize that there's a line of authority. And when there is a line of authority, when you're dealing with your children, it makes um, it easier to negotiate the family rules and things like that. And then the, um, the last one is your job and your ministry and your friends. You know, that's the priority that comes next under that. You know what? They don't have the, same, the place as somebody who's your blood relative mm -mm. you know these this is your job and your ministry and your friends and as much as you love all of that you know you may love your job I love my job but at the same time there's a place that it falls in my life and uh, you know keeping Jesus in the middle of your job is an important thing as well because it shows your integrity and things like that you know can you do your job without compromising your beliefs yeah. that's a good in indication as to whether or not you're in the right place or not my oldest daughter that, that uh, we've been talking about, you know, that was the artist and stuff, well, she actually went to art school and, and you know, went for, to be an animator. And when she was uh, graduated from that, she actually got an opportunity to, um, to be an animator, her break, you know, to be an animator for a popular animated cartoon series. Family Guy. Oh, sorry. And, uh, you know, she didn't like the... You know, when, in looking at it, she didn't like the, uh, the attitudes, she didn't like the language and things like that that came across and, and what was being portrayed. So she just, you know, at the sake of, of missing a, a golden opportunity, she just said, no, not going to do it. God's got a better one for me. And she ended up working for Disney, you know. And so she's been there, and she ended up meeting her husband there and everything, you know. Right? And so it was, you know, because she didn't do that, she didn't get off track, but she kept her, her value systems in the right place. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, your time is very important in keeping it in the right place with God. You know, who is it that you hang out with? Are they people that are exalting, you know, taking the, bringing the best out of you? It's really important that you do, you know, or do they cause you to have questionable behavior? In uh, Psalm 127, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, sometimes... Just, and well, I'm almost done with this, and then I'll let you talk. But sometimes, um, you know, you do have to feed one of those, these areas a little bit more than another. So, you know, don't be too confused. As long as in your heart you've got the right order down and stuff. You know, sometimes, like, for instance, with your job. You know, maybe you've been out of a job, and you finally got a job, and you've got to work extra. You know, maybe you've got to pull an extra job to make your goals in your family or something like that. You've got to, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do to make life happen. Sometimes, you know, your, your child has an illness or something that, that's going to cause you to devote more time to your daughter or your, your son than maybe your wife for the moment, you know, and things like that. But priority-wise, you, you can keep the priority straight. And, uh, but I do want to caution you that sometimes you can overfeed any of these areas. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you find yourself overfeeding like maybe you become a workaholic or something and you just look for a reason to not devote your time on one of these other areas and then it becomes an issue and you need when you realize that that's the case 
Ask yourself why and go before God and let God show you that maybe you're running from something else that's going on in your life and you need to get your priorities back in shape. Amen? Yes, good, good, good. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, very good. I, I was enjoying that, honey. Oh, good. good. I'm glad. Anyway, um, our second point is you have to continually grow in your relationships. Now, Mike talked about the priorities that need to be there. But with everything in life, if there's not growth, then it, becomes, it begins to diminish. In your Christian walk, if you're not growing, guess what? You're backsliding. If a tree isn't growing, it's dying, right? And so I think sometimes we, we forget to realize that uh, in a marriage, a healthy marriage, and children that are being raised in, in, to go on to know the Lord, it, it takes constant work. I mean, you're going to have to, you know, tell your flesh to shut up, and you're going to have to work at having a marriage that's growing, that you're communicating, that, that you know, she's changing, you're changing, you know, uh, your children are changing. Don't you know your children are changing? And, and you have to be aware of their world and some of the influences that are coming into their world and in their heart so that, so that everything can stay in the proper order. 2 Peter 3, 18 says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, what I've found a lot of times is I'll, I'll minister to women in, in my office, and they'll say that they, them and their husband came and got saved maybe at the same time, and, uh, and they've, uh, maybe she's continued coming, and the husband maybe walked in it for a little while, or it can be, you know, the, the wife that does this began to walk with the Lord for a while, but then for whatever reasons, didn't want to go to church all the time or didn't want to be as active as her. And so now he's almost become antagonistic about her wanting to come to church, wanting to raise the kids in church and, and that kind of thing. And, and what you need to know is if you're not growing in your relationship with God, God is the only one that completely and totally satisfies you. Can I hear an amen in the church? Amen, amen. You are created in his image. You are a spirit. You have a soul that's your mind, your will, your emotions, and you live in that body. And we are in a flesh-ruled society. Every billboard, every commercial, everything is just tugging at you. And, and, and the flesh screams to be satisfied, but it's not satisfied. But it sends you on a wrong tangent. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and the Bible says that your flesh is like the leech that cries, that drains you. Mm -hmm. And enough is not enough. And so what you've got to do, you've got a purpose in your heart that Jesus ultimately is going to be your source of satisfaction. Yes, and right. then second place, you are going to find satisfaction in your wife. So if she's not looking as lovely as the airbrushed uh, magazines or billboards, you have to get before God and still purpose to love her and wives to love him and not compare him with an ex or compare him with your, even your Bible you know, pastor hero or whatever. You have got to purpose to love him and the best gift you will ever give your children is a happy marriage. If you love your children, if for no other reason, if you love your children, purpose to love your wife. And there's been times, especially early in our marriage, when we were adjusting and, you know, even at different times when we would have, you know, tough spots in our marriage, I would get before God and I would say, God, I'm going to love him because you told me to love him. And, and you do, you, you, you live your life before God. And you purpose to love that person. And the reason why I'm saying that is many times when communication get, begins to break down, you're not receiving the word of God like you need to. You're not coming to church. You're not, you know, spending time with the Father. And you're, you'll begin to have a void in your life. And you'll try to stuff it with other things. And it can be food. It can be, you know, sports. It can be whatever. You will seek to fulfill a void that only God ultimately can fill, and then your spouse, you'll begin to fill with other things. 
And many times that's when the husband, you know, the wife's been nagging at home and he doesn't like the to-do list he comes home to every night and the fact that the kids are out of control and fighting or whatever. So, you know, maybe he lingers at, job, at the job. It's a little bit easier to work late and get a kudo from your supervisor than to go home and deal with the mess at home. But talk to God about it and say, God, you are number one. And I see in your word, I've, got, I've been told to love my wife as Christ loves the church. And Christ died for the church. So I'm laying down what I want to do. The, the guys are saying, let's hang out all day on Saturday. We talked to a couple. Every Saturday, all day. All day. He works on cars with his brothers and his friends. And they drink beer together. So that's all of Saturday. And then she goes to church on Sunday. No wonder they're not getting along. And again, I'm not even thinking of who that was I talked to. But I'm just saying that you, you have to decide I'm not going to get my need met somewhere else. I'm not going to escape what's uncomfortable and, and less than lovely. I'm going to stay before God. Yeah. I'm going to communicate yeah. with my wife or my husband. And I'm going to work on what needs to be worked on. Do you hear me? And so you've got to be growing in your relationship. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 24.3 says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. And we need to work to understand if we have stepchildren that we don't know as well as our own children. We have to communicate with our spouse and work to get to know those stepchildren. And if we don't understand their motivation, that we talk and we communicate. And in doing that, you'll begin to grow in your relationship. Some things that, that you shouldn't do that I call dirty pool is do things like compare your spouse to your ex. That's wrong. Yeah. If your ex has to call you over the kids, Things like that, you make those conversations brief, you make them to the point, you make them about the kids, you try to be fair and upright, but then your honor and your respect and your highest devotion goes to the spouse of the relationship that you're in. Do you hear me? You might have been with that other ex for 20 years, and now you've only been with this guy too, but he has to be Lord in your home. He has to be the one that has your heart and your focus and your desire. Do you hear me? Yes. And so uh, do that and, and seek to honor your, your spouse. Don't ever tear down your ex in your children's eyes. That's a big one. One thing that Mike did, you know, I was beginning to have my eyes open toward our daughter's uh, uh, mom. And I was overwhelmed at her, you know, flakiness and lack of parenting skills. And um, so I was tempted to want to say something. And Mike would say, no, no, no. He said, she is her mother. We're going to honor her as her mother. We're only going to seek to speak well of her. And if Chantel ever finds out what's wrong with her mother, it will be, she will find out on her own. We're not going to be the ones to uncover and reveal and tear down. Amen. And that's very important. Because, you know, we work with children. We work with children for 18 years. And we see these little hearts get broken many times. They're having a hard enough time figuring out why mom and dad couldn't work it out. But then when you talk bad about each other, in their heart, they're loyal to both parents. Yes. They don't know he's a jerk and, and she's a whatever. They, all they know is this is mom and this is dad. And my life used to seem happy even though I guess they were fighting. I didn't know. And so they love both parents. And when you begin to talk about each other, it plays tug of war with their emotions. And inside, they feel like they have to defend. And they feel like they have to choose. And that is so wrong. And that's actually what tears them up emotionally and causes them to be insecure and not adjusted well. And Chantel, you know, bless her heart, she's one of the most well-adjusted emotionally people I've seen. I think she's too well-adjusted emotionally. No, she's, she's wonderful. She's got our two grandkids, her and her husband. They're amazing. But um, my point is, Mike wouldn't play those kinds of games. Now, his, his ex would a lot of times say, oh, you don't want to be a Christian. Dad's such a boring Christian. And, and so she got some of that from, on her mom's side. But Mike refused to do that. He took the higher road. And look at the place she has in our life now. She's, she, they live down the street from us. We're very involved in their lives. They're members here. You know, we have an amazing life together because we took the high road. And God wants you to do that. Amen. 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 I think that's good. Think Pretty that's sure. Good. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Not one more thing. No. It's good. Go ahead. Okay. I have one more. One more. 
trying to keep my eyes on the clock. I kind of learned to, you know, what she Those of you, yeah. you know, if you're older, see, I was 30 when we got married. And uh, Mike had been married before. And my testimony is similar to Pastor Deborah's in that I, I wasn't married before. I just kind of been with everybody. But, um, but I had come to the Lord actually about the same time Mike had. We didn't know each other at the time. But he'd been, you know, he'd been divorced and, and celibate for nine years. And I'd come to the Lord and I'd been celibate for nine years. So guess what? We needed to be married. But anyway, <laughs> um, and I don't suggest a long engagement when that's your, your place in life. But anyway, <laughs> where was I going with that? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you thinking about, honey? That's what I want to know. But, uh, no, we did most of our dating with Chantel asleep oh, on gosh. the back seat, and that well, was very know, healthy. <laughs> when I asked her to marry me, my daughter was in the back seat. Snoring. She had kind of an uh, asthma, so she was snoring really loudly when he asked me to marry him. Driving across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco. <laughs> anyway. Um, but we talked about everything, and what I wanted to say is if you're older and, and you're single, the chances of you marrying someone that has been married before is very likely. And that's something you have to pray about. Mm -hmm. You know, I had dated, you know, Christian men, and, and, uh, but God had never spoke to my heart like he did concerning Mike. And yet my parents' first concern was, well, he's, he's got a daughter. I mean, you know, people refer to that as, as baggage. You know, and here I hadn't been married before, so my parents are like, you know, shouldn't you marry someone at your same place in life? But what I, I, I knew it was God. I knew God was in it. I had total peace. But what, I said, what I've said to other people over the years is I, I said that in my heart, um, when I was asked the question, would you ever marry someone that had been divorced, I said I would have to be uh, convinced that emotionally they were completely over the other relationship and that God had totally healed them and that they weren't taking those issues into a new situation. And I had to be convinced that it was God. And I was. I was convinced. But, um, but my point is, is when you, when you start to date someone that perhaps has been married before and has children, and maybe he has custody or she has custody, maybe she doesn't, you have got to talk about issues before you hit them. And something that seems to be uh, uh, amazingly missing sometimes when, kid, when people start dating is, is uh, the, the finances that can be involved. Mm -hmm. if, your, if the man that you're considering dating does not have custody of ch his children, he may be paying out actually a lot of money a month to go for the, the, the care of those kids. And, and, and rightfully so. You know, he has to be responsible toward that. And you have got to embrace that. You've got to look that in the eyes that that $1,000 or 1200 or 800 or whatever it is will not be yours every month, and you can't resent it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is what I see happening sometimes maybe on the other end, is that there's so much financial pressure he goes on, he gets married, and that's, that new spouse says, well, hey, we've got a couple kids already. What's a couple more? I'm tired of paying this out every month. Let's take her back to court. Let's get those kids. You know, and you on the other end, maybe you're on the part of trying to get in for all you can. I, I, I caution women a lot of times, don't, don't go there. You know, an a, a, a equitable, equitable amount is, is reasonable, and that's fair, and that's right, and that's within the, the laws of our land and all that. But if you're just trying to stick somebody, you're just trying to get him, mm -hmm. uh, many times you can lose your children later on because he yeah. gets tired and weary of that. Yeah. And if you're financially stable, maybe you've remarried or you're financially stable, you know, be wise with that. That was, that was free. But you have to talk about those things. You have to talk about finances because that's where it's going to hit. Yeah. You have to talk about what will be the, the governing, you know, body in the house. You can't say, well, don't touch my kids. You can't, ha you, you know, you can't ever tell my kids what to do. I'm their parent. So I'm going to take care of my kids. You're going to take care of your kids. That's not going to work because that is not family. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to work to get on the same page, which leads us to our third point. Yes. Walk in the power of agreement. Amen. Well, you know, uh, the last thing, and I know we're, you know, we're pushing time right now. So the last thing is I just want to briefly say is we need to learn how to walk in the power of agreement. You know, when you get married, you, you have a God-given um, power uh, principle that comes your way, you know, that says that, that if two or more shall agree as to touching anything, it'll be done for them. You know, and, uh, you know, in 18, fact, 19. in Matthew 18, 19, this is what it says. It says, again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven.
For where two or more, two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, you know what? This is a very important thing for you to realize because as a married couple, you now have that agreement or the potential of that agreement all the time with you. Awesome. And it is so important. You know, the Bible says that one will put a thousand a flight, two will put ten thousand a flight. You know, that's not just two will put two thousand a flight, but it's two will put ten thousand a flight. And so the, the, it's just tenfold what it was. And, you know, it's, that's the way that God made us is to be in agreement with someone so that we can see things happen. And so, you know, he's telling us that, man, you know, if, uh, if there's any two of you that, that you need something of God, then if you will put yourself in that point of agreement and really truly work towards getting in agreement, not just, you know, condescending or anything, but you're really in agreement, you will see, um, you will really be able to whoop some double butt. Yeah. You know yep. what I'm saying? And the thing that's so important, we just, we discovered this years ago when we were back in, in really, we knew it already, but we really got to see it when we were hitting some financial difficulties ourselves when we were back, at, you know, just graduating from Bible college and stuff. And, uh, you know, some different things, loans came up to, uh, to where we had to pay some things and, and we had to get it. And we found out just overnight, we needed like $15,000 and we didn't have it coming in. And so, you know, we're like, oh gosh, what are we gonna do? Well, we need to have it. You know, God's going to provide. God is our provider. Amen? Amen? So God's our provider. So we knew that. And, you know, we were working as much as we could. We knew God could open up a door. We could, we could get an extra job. We could do this or that. I mean, one year, in fact, my wife was, you know, we were, we were joking about it. We, we, t between the two of us, we worked seven jobs one year. You know, just making it happen. And, and uh, you know, she made crafts and put it in, in, a, in, a, in a little place, you know, a little boutique and and Avon. I mean, anything, Avon, yeah, whatever, you know, Tupperware, you know, you name it, whatever we could, we did it, you know, to make it happen. And, uh, but you know, we were still in need. And I remember we got together and we said, we are, you know, we're going to, enough's enough. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, you know, the devil crosses over that line and you just say, that's it. You know, we're, we're done messing with you, devil. Now we're going to get together and we're going to rely on God. And the two of us, we decided that at that particular time, we couldn't afford it, but we, we worked it out somehow. We were able to go to a little uh, hotel downtown, and we were able to rent a room there, and we just decided we are going to get on our face before God with no distractions from anything else. You know, it doesn't have to be that. It could be, you know, at the beach. It could be anywhere that you want to choose. But the fact was, was that we had to do that, and we got in agreement. We prayed through it, mm -hmm. and we got into agreement, and, and to where we knew that we knew that we knew that our prayers were going to be answered. And within three weeks, everything came in that we needed. Three months, rather. Three months. Everything came in that we had uh, need of. And it was just a supernatural thing. It came in at just the right time so that we didn't have to, to be out on any of it. And, you know, God provided. And we thought, wow, this is really cool. And we realized that, well, there's been years, you know, times, multiple times ever since then, that uh, sometimes you have that tendency to try to do things on your own. You're trying to solve things and you're trying to do things in the natural and work it out. And stuff. And it's not that you don't love God, but, but you know, you just start doing that. And then all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm getting beat up here. I need to just, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, that's it. And get in agreement and believe God. And so, you know, whenever we have done that, we have seen miraculous, mighty things happen. And, you know, when you're in a marriage situation, it's a perfect opportunity for you to be in total agreement and to be able to see miracles take place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, well, in summary, in summary, because it's already a quarter after seven, <laughs> boy, you are right, Dr. Henney. <laughs> you know, he said that, he says, man, he says, whatever it is that you have, you, you might as well cut it in half because that's all the time you're going to have to do it. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, in summary, the first thing was to keep your priorities right. And Number the second two. thing was? Grow in your relationships. Grow in your relationships. And the third thing is to walk in the power of agreement. And uh, I, don't know, I hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, amen. Praise God. I just want to ask you something. Okay, please, everybody stay in your seats. Nobody moving around or anything. But I want to just ask you. We're going to get serious right now. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. We talked about priorities especially. And, and that kind of 
uh, leads me into what I'm going to ask you. I want to ask you something right now. I want to ask if, if you have the right priorities in place when it comes to God. You know, is he truly number one in your life? And I'll ask you this. Maybe we can help determine where you're at. Okay, first thing I want to ask you is that if you were to leave right now, you leave this place, you know, and as much fun as you've had and you've actually been in church and all of that, you know, maybe you leave and you go out to your car and on the way out to your car, you should have a heart attack or your heart stops and you find yourself opening up your eyes again somewhere else. Can you say honestly that you're going to open your eyes in heaven or are you going to say that you're going to open your eyes in hell? You know, really, I mean, this is one of those things that's a question that only you can answer, you and God, at this point. And I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or nothing, but I'm just wanting for you to get real. I want you to see how important it is. You know, so many of us, we, we know people that uh, one day you see them leaving, maybe in a car or something, and the next, the next day you hear that they'd gotten in an accident and then their life was gone. You know, and you think, oh, I sure hope they knew Jesus. Well, you know what? I sure hope that you know Jesus. Now, the thing is, is this. You may have asked, you know, when, you, when I asked you that, you may have said, well, I, I think so. I think I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Well, you know what? The Bible doesn't say anything about if you think that you can think your way into heaven. It doesn't say that at all. You know, maybe you say, well, I, I hope I'll go to heaven. You know, I hope I... You know, after all, I mean, I, I, I've lived a good life. I, I hope I can go there. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't say you can hope your way into heaven either. You know, you say, well, I've, I've been a good person. I've really been a, a good guy. I, you know, I haven't robbed any convenience stores. I never hung out with, uh, with anybody bad or anything like that. You know, I've been a really good person. I've, I've stuck to the letters of the law all the way through. You know, but the Bible doesn't say that that's what it is that causes you to go to heaven either, to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Wow, that's an interesting thing, huh? Sometimes we try to work it all out and, and try to work out, and we think that, you know, and our society promotes the fact that, that if you are really good, then surely, you know, good people go to heaven. You know, there was a guy by the name of Nicodemus that came to, to Jesus himself in John chapter 3. He came to Jesus and he said, you know, Master, now this guy, this guy was good. He was as good as anybody could be. He was a good, uh, a good Pharisee. And, you know, he did everything right as far as what there was for him to do in his church or his synagogue at the time. But he went to Jesus. He says, Master, you know, Rabbi, you, you've done all these miracles. You are obviously a man sent from God. You know, how is it that I'm to go to heaven and, and how am I supposed to live eternally? And God said, you must be born again. Well, Nicodemus didn't quite know what to do with that, but he went on to explain, Jesus did. He says, you must be born again. Now, in, in our society, what we think born again means, we, we, you know, we get kind of, Oh, gosh, you know, the born-again people. The, what's been portrayed in our TVs and in our movies and stuff seems to be that those, those guys are something weird and everything. But get beyond that, okay? Jesus himself said that you must be born again. What's that mean? That means that you are to put your priority right. You're supposed to make him number one in your life. You're supposed to uh, give him all your heart and all of your life. He went on in John chapter 3 towards the, the end of John chapter 3 after he was talking to Nicodemus here and he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. You know what I'm going to ask you right now? I'm going to count to three and I'm going to, at the end, at the, when I'm done counting to three, I'm going to go like this and I'm going to ask you at that point to raise your hand up if you want to confirm the fact that Jesus Christ is number one in your life. I'm going to give you that opportunity so that you can be confident that if something were to happen and you were to open your eyes, you would open them in the presence of God. You know, the Bible says to, 
to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, I mean, I think it's great for a believer, that is. So what I'm thinking right now is that I need you to think about what it is that you want to do with your life. Do you want to be sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's your Lord, he's your Savior? Or do you want to leave this place tonight not knowing? I'm going to count to three right now. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand up. You know, you might say, but Pastor Mike, I'm going to be embarrassed if, you know, people around me, they think that I'm already born again and stuff. And, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed. Okay, well, just let it go, man. You know, don't worry about it. You may be embarrassed, but isn't that worth a little bit of embarrassment than to spend eternity in hell? Absolutely. We've all been there. You know, we've all had to make that decision at some point in our life those of us that are in here that are Christians. We've all had to do it. So why not join the family of God and be a part of us? Know that Jesus Christ is your Lord, your Savior, your boss forever and ever. One, are you just sitting here thinking maybe this should be me? You know what? I got news for you. It is you. If you're at that point and you don't know, Let's make it final, once and for all. Two, three. I see that hand. One, two, three, four, five. You can put your hands down once you, once I, six. All right. And is there any others here that want to join these six? I'm having a hard time kind of seeing out there, so, all right. Well, you know what? For the sake of time, oh, I see, okay. I see that, I see that other hand over here, that's seven. All right, this is what I want you to do right now. I want everybody to stand up right now. If that was you, and you raised your hand up, and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I'd like for you to do right now is I want you to go ahead and get your Bible, your coat, your books, you know, if you're a child and you need to have your parent come with you, that's cool, or a friend, somewhere. I want you to come on down to the front here because we're going to pray with you and we're going to give you an opportunity. Amen. Amen. opportunity okay smile guys this is a good thing amen we're so happy you know the Bible says that when one person comes to know Jesus that the heavens the heavens are rejoicing and and the angels themselves oh here comes another up here coming on up let's give him a hand Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to let you go off with, see Pastor Dave over here? Turn to your left, my right. Pastor Dave is going to take you back here to the altar room back here, and they're going to pray with you. They're going to give you some information that you need, and if you need to have a friend, somebody that can walk along with you and teach you in the things of God, then he's going to give you, we call those SPT, Spiritual Personal Trainers. And he's going to go ahead and, and he will direct you and get all the information that you need and, and help you through this, okay? God bless you so much. This is a great decision that you make. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, go ahead and, and sit down. If we can just have one more minute before you guys get dismissed to go out to the um, to the connect night out there. In praying for tonight's uh, service, Mike and I felt impressed that God wanted us to pray for families. And 
How many of you know that issues with your children definitely affect your marriage, right? Right. So if there's, there's a struggle going on in your home, maybe you've got teenagers, young adults, maybe it's just, you know, his and her, you know, his kids, your kids, you know, then the kids you've got together, you know, everybody's fighting or there's issues going on with that. Um, we want to pray for you tonight. And I just feel impressed that um, if you're married, if you're here with your spouse, that maybe you should stand with your spouse. If you're a single parent and, and you're struggling with issues that maybe pertain to your children or maybe your ex, whatever, if you'd like to stand at this time too, I want to pray for you. There's something about acknowledging it, standing before God or raising your hand, that kind of thing, that uh, there's faith released towards you. So if you know you need prayer right now, just be bold and stand. We've all, we're all there so many times. Don't worry about it. You're in a family that loves you. Yes, amen. We want to be, come alongside you and pray with you. Right. Many times we do this in the area of healing. But right now I want you as a congregation, those that are still seated, to look around. And I want you to lay your hand on the shoulder of someone that's near you. And we're going to pray yes. for the marriages and families represented in this church yes. because we need strong families. Yes. We need to be a light to speak to this generation. Yes. We need miracles to go on in our own families, in our own yes. marriages, so that we can reach out with, with help and answers to other people. That's right. Amen? Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for our brothers and sisters right now that are represented here. Father, whether it's their children, whether the children and what's going on there is affecting the marriage, whether it's a single mom or dad that's struggling because of the influence of the ex, whatever is going on right now, Father, we pray for those that stand before you now, Father. Father, you said in your word that we should confess our faults one, for, one to another and pray for one another. And Father, right now they're vulnerable. They've said to the whole congregation, I need prayer. And so, Father, we come alongside our brothers and our sisters right now, Father, and we pray on their behalf. Father, we come in agreement. And you said, whatever two agree on earth is touching, that it would be done unto us of you, the Father. For where two or three are gathered, and we've got many more than that, you are in the midst of us yes. to establish those prayers. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for every child that's not serving you. We pray for every strife that's going on in the home. Father, we pray for every marriage that's struggling. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch husbands, touch wives, touch children, and that peace would come into those homes. Peace and love would come into those marriage, marriages. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And so, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for your healing, miracle-working power to saturate these homes. Father, let husbands and wives break down barriers of pride between each other. May they come together and repent and love each other. May they, as in one accord, set forth what the order needs to be in the home and say that as for us and our house, we will serve the Lord and, and honor and respect your word, honor and respect you, and as a household, come to the house of God to receive the word of yes. God. Father, we thank you for meeting every need in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. Yes. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. amen, amen. Now here's the deal. You overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. So when those miracles start happening, which we're in faith, we're believing, you send in a little shout. You've all got email, you text, you do it all. Send us a shout. Yes. Shout about yes. it. We want to declare that Jesus is Lord over our families. Right. Jesus yes. is Lord over our marriages. Jesus is 